I've been asked to talk about the, the regulatory environment and the political view, which right now in election year is front and center and it's incredibly difficult to understand. So the title here is kind of a regulatory overview or how I learned to stop worrying and love the EPA. Now for those, those young folks in the room, that's actually a Dr. Strangelove reference, which was a Stanley Kubrick movie um, in black and white. Um, so I've dated myself. I, I, the young people in our offices had absolutely no clue <laughs> about this title. So I was hoping that true to form an oil and gas audience might be kind of have more gray hair than folks in our audience. So <clears throat> it, it is difficult to handicap what's happening in Washington. So I'm going to talk about three examples of political ineptness in Washington. If you can't get this right, how are you possibly going to get long-term energy policy right? I'm going to talk about the Keystone Pipeline. I'm going to talk about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I'll talk a little bit about, about hydraulic fracturing, recognizing that I got the expert right here. So I'll try not to step in it. Um, party affiliation is not important. It doesn't matter if you have a D or an R by your name in Washington. Everybody is equally inept at understanding energy. <laughs> okay. The fundamental issue here is political cycles are longer, are shorter, much shorter than energy cycles. So it's hard to look over the horizon and do the right thing on energy when you've got a re-election coming up in two years or four years or, or whatever. So uh, it, it creates some real angst. So let's talk about the Keystone Pipeline. In my mind, this is an absolute slam dunk. I got, a, I got heavy, heavy, allegedly heavy crude that you add diluent to that becomes relatively light crude uh, that you ship to the Gulf Coast. My mother-in-law is an environmental scientist. She thinks the Keystone Pipeline is a bad idea. She's a very smart lady. I was like, okay, why? So she gives me the playbook from the environmental groups on why this is a bad idea. Okay, so let's talk about the alternative to the Keystone Pipeline. What if you don't build that? Where does that oil go? Does it sit in Canada in storage tanks? No, there's a pipeline that goes to Canada or to, uh, w to Prince Rupert on the West Coast and that crude goes to China. That is absolutely national security brain damage. Can Canada is our largest source of imported crude and we're gonna open up and give the Chinese access to that is absolutely a, 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 the wrong thing to do from a national security perspective. There will be more tanker miles. If you think about what happens uh, on a pipeline, pipeline from Alberta to Houston, the spill risk is low, and if there is a, a spill, it's very, very small. You're increasing tanker miles significantly by putting oil on a tanker and shipping it to China, and those are not necessarily US flag tankers because it's going from Canada to China, so we don't have anything to do with that. And a fun fact, the Exxon Valdez, my kids learned in elementary school that it was the largest oil spill in the world. It is actually the 37th largest oil spill, tanker spill in the world. When you talk about transportation, tankers are where you have the greatest risk of an oil spill, not pipelines, unless you go back to the old Soviet era. Very little crude to spill with, with pipelines. If you're really worried about the environment, you don't put crude on a tanker, you put it in a pipeline. Okay, now. They've got, the environmental groups have Nebraskans worked up that, that Nebraska is going to be some, some wasteland if this pipeline runs through it. Uh, and I will say what y'all are thinking, well, how is that different from before Keystone? <laughs> I, I, I went to a and we'll start our SEC chant um, after the meeting. Um, you, 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 U.S., Here's the other point. These U.S. refineries on the other end of that pipeline, what are they going to do, sit around and do nothing? No. They're going to import crude. Where are they going to import that crude from? Oh, probably Venezuela or Brazil or Angola or Nigeria. Feels to me like more national security brain damage. I would, I'm trading Canada for Nigeria. I don't like that trade. I'm also increasing tanker miles. Again, increasing environmental risk. If these guys cared about the environment, they'd build more pipelines, not put more oil on tankers. Uh, this is absolute, it's, it's ridiculous uh, beyond description that this Keystone Pipeline has become an issue. Hydraulic fracturing doesn't contaminate groundwater. Microseismic analysis, this is done by the guys at Pinnacle Technologies, now a division of, of Halliburton. What do these guys do? They listen to the, to the fracture grow in three dimensions. So you put microphones on the surface and in offset wells and you listen as you crack the rock. So you can, 
measure and monitor the fracture in three dimensions. So what you get is you can get ab the, the maximum height growth and the maximum amount that it grew down. This is a graph that's hard to read, but the point here is this is over 3,000 frac jobs in the Barnett. You have the same thing for the, for the Marcellus. Deeper fracs on the left, shallower fracs on the right, and the spikes are the top of one frac and the bottom is the, the bottom of another frac. What you find is you rarely have in the Barnett un, unsustained height growth, but even in the instances that, that you do, you're still thousands of feet below the blue, which is your drinking water. Hydraulic fractures don't contaminate groundwater, period. Now, you can contaminate groundwater when you drill a well through an aquifer. Well, it, it, the fracturing process has nothing to do with it, okay? I did hydraulic fracturing research a long time ago in, in graduate school, and when you hear the media talk about and the environmental groups talk about it being a new process, that is your, that, that's your key to say, okay, these guys have an agenda. So it doesn't contaminate groundwater. The EPA is finally starting to admit that, but now the, the argument turns to water usage and water disposal. If you want to look at water use, look at a golf course relative to the oil field, okay? Um, the, the fundamental point here is, uh, okay, so the media's in app. The, the New York Times it has been absolutely just unbelievable on this issue. Right? I mean, the, the, it, so much so that the New York Time, Times Ombudsman actually came out. Sorry for media members here, by the way. Um, media, media members who are not here are inept. The, <laughs> did, did I save myself? The, 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 the New York Times Ombudsman had to come out and actually reprimand their reporting on hydraulic fracturing. That had to be a very painful process for them, and it was actually fun. Um, but, but here's the issue with fracturing. It's not about does it contaminate groundwater or air. If you really look at why people are against fracturing, at least the, the, the folks who are kind of rustling up the scare tactics, fracturing has allowed significant gas production. And that allows low gas prices. And if gas prices are low, electricity prices are low. And if electricity prices are low, wind and solar don't work. Right? Had drinks with a guy at the Environmental Defense Fund. He says, $4 gas, <laughs> wouldn't we love for $4 gas now? $4 gas is bad because it makes wind and solar uneconomic. $4 gas is the best thing to happen to the U.S. I've got a slide coming on that. But the point is, anti-hydraulic fracturing is not going away. The industry is going to show that it doesn't contaminate groundwater. And they're going to come after us for air quality. They're going to come after us for water disposal. They're going to come after us for source water because Cheap gas makes wind and solar uneconomic. That's the agenda. And if you start from that fairly cynical endpoint, I think you can kind of understand what's happening out there. So they're not going away, and it's just so the, the reality is that's, that's going to be headwinds for the next little while. Strategic Petroleum Reserve. <laughs> now. <laughs> okay. So... So, so this is where the young guys in the room are laughing and the old guys are going, who don't text, are going, what, what? So, so for you old guys who don't text, we'll have a separate session afterwards to explain this graph. So you, you've got the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, roughly 700 million barrels, and it is our last, it is our last insurance against the supply disruption. We refine, or, or let's say we, can, we, we refine roughly 15 million barrels of oil a day. We have 17, 700 million barrels in caverns on the Gulf Coast. That is not very much cover on a day's supply basis, right? If there is a disruption in oil supplies, that's why you need strategic petroleum reserve. The word strategic is in, in the name for a reason, right? That said, high prices are a disaster for, for any politician's poll numbers, right? President Obama went to Cushing, Oklahoma yesterday. Right? I'd have lost a bet that said in the first four years of his presidency he would visit Cushing, Oklahoma. It is the reddest of red states, and you know, he didn't go there because they have good chicken fried steak. He went there because he's got to show that he's, he cares and is doing something. The problem is the, the energy cycle's long, political cycles are short. It's very difficult to do anything about high gasoline prices. What you hear is SPR release is going to control these evil speculators. 
So let's make sure we understand anybody who, so calling someone a speculator is the equivalent of calling a dog a non-cat. It is accurate, <laughs> but not descriptive, right? I, I'm in the commodity market every day, and I have yet to find a speculator. There are guys who are buying and selling crude oil for various reasons over various time horizons. And what you saw when the SPR was released last summer, it drove, it drove the evil speculators out for two days. And a week later, prices were higher than before the release was announced, right? Because the release of the strategic reserve shows weakness, right? It shows we've, you know, that, and, and what happens is now you've got to fill the reserve back, right? So at some point, you're going to have to pull those barrels back. Right. I think strategic should mean in case of disruption, not when you know, pump prices are you know, politically unpopular. Again, how do you not get this one right? Um, and historically, if you look, it is only short-term impact on price, but you can show you're doing something, right? It is the, it is the political Hail Mary. And again, this isn't, this isn't a reflection on President Obama. This is any politician who's done this, whether it's President Clinton or whoever. The, it, it, it doesn't have a long-term impact on price, but it is something they can do to say, hey, look, I care, right? The Bill, you remember Bill Clinton, the quivering lower lip, I feel your pain sort of thing. That's, that's what you end up with here. And it is the wrong uh, political solution, but it's, it's the reality. And, and between now and November, you're going to hear a lot about gasoline prices and a lot of disinformation from both sides. Um, but the SPR will be more kind of front and center. Why don't you release it? Uh, to, to put some re uh, relief on gas prices. Here's the real interesting part of shales. This is, this is U.S. gas production. I think from a policy perspective, guys in Washington are going to ultimately figure this one out. For, de for a decade, we couldn't grow gas production in the U.S., and look what's happened really since, since 05 and 06, and this is the shale revolution where guys to my right are doing all the heavy lifting on this and making it happen, where you can actually grow gas production, and, and some of the cheapest BTUs in the world are in U.S. domestic natural gas. And, and if you look at the U.S. manufacturing sector, it is really driven by ga natural gas and electricity, right? It's a, it's a clean manufacturing sector. There's not a lot of smokestack oil. That, when gas prices are low, it keeps power prices low. So a guy making widgets in the U.S. is now at a competitive advantage for the first time in a very long time relative to those, his competitors anywhere else in the world. Low gas prices are good for the U.S. economy. They're good for the manufacturing sector. They're fantastic for the Gulf Coast because of the petrochemical and refining complex, which I think uh, Tom's going to talk about. Um, you know, and I think the guys in Washington are ultimately pragmatic about that, given what we've been through the last few years. I think ultimately common sense does prevail, and the, the, you, can, you can show substantive, tangible results of what the industry is doing and what that means to the U.S. economy. I think ultimately the guys in Washington are going to figure that out. Now, the question is, what do they do with that? Right. So I've, I've got two quotes, right? Thomas Jefferson and, and Thoreau, this quote's attributed to both these guys, right? The government that governs best governs least. I, I kind of like the modern day philosophers, Motley Crue, right? Don't go away mad, just go away, <laughs> right? Give us, just get out of the way, don't regulate. But the point is, get out of the way, clear a path and the market's going to fix this, and the market's going to work, right? You've seen what's happened with gas shales, right? The biggest risk here is that we have another, in a second term with President Obama, the EPA is unleashed, right? To, to kind of make, make regulations and to kind of, that, that Congress really doesn't have much control of. And I think that's the biggest risk. And I think people who are looking to make incremental investments in natural gas on the consumption side, so if you're a chemical guy and gonna make a big investment, you have to have, con um, some comfort that there isn't going to be increased regulation on fracturing that reduces activity that drives prices higher, right? So you've got to have some, there's got to be a duration and some, I think once we get through the election, we'll have some clarity on how that's going to work. Um, I think ultimately on the oil side, the, the, the gasoline prices take center stage, right? That's what, what people know. You pass 10 gas stations uh, between home and work every day. You see the prices going up like this. And that creates a lot of political rhetoric during election season. So 
Um, I, I think you know, fundamentally it's hard to know where, where policy is going. The Republicans haven't shown their hands yet. Uh, I think as you get closer to November, we'll have a lot more clarity on what these guys are going to do because high gasoline prices are going to force a public discussion on energy policy. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Steve. All right.